Welcome back, everyone. Um, session two for the day is our governance convergence and supply chain session. We have four speakers. Um, our keynote speaker for today is Nicholas Gruen, and Nicholas has advised two cabinet ministers, directed the Business Council's New Directions program, sat on the Productivity Commission, and is CEO of Economic Policy Consultancy, Lateral Economics, and Peach Financial. Importantly, in 2009, he chaired the federal government's 2.0 task force, um, and he's here today to talk to us about open innovation why it's so easy and why it's so hard. Would you please join me in welcoming Nick Gruen. Thanks very much. Um, okay, well, I thought I'd, I'll, I've got a fairly um, substantial set of slides. So I'll see how far I get in about 20 or 25 minutes. Um, the first thing I should say is that I'm no, although I grew up on a farm, I can't claim to any special expertise in the areas of uh, interest to you, but uh, I think it is worth uh, trying to look at what you're looking at from a, a broader uh, perspective, which is, you know, what is this thing called Web2, what's, what makes it work, uh, and therefore, uh, how should you be operating in it? Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, this is Met, uh, uh, you're looking at a guy called Bob Metcalf, who came up with Metcalf's law. And Metcalf's law is a pretty simple uh, is a pretty simple idea, and it's uh, the, he, it's illustrated here. Uh, here are here are three networks, and you will see that the number of connections between any two points in a network goes up rather quickly as the number of points go up, and it goes up, up roughly as the number of points squared. So is what's significant about that? Well, it, 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 the, the, the point is that networks become more, uh, you know, the more people in a net network, the more useful it is squared. Um, but Web 2 is something else again, because as you will see, the, at the, each of those nodes on the network, that's not exactly a very high-tech thing on the, for, uh, as far as we're concerned on the other end of, uh, as a node on that network, it's a telephone. But, so, so Web2 does something which is really very simple. Um, it, it sort of multilateralizes point-to-point -point contact. What do I mean by that? Well, if two people one is in Sydney and one's in New York are having a conversation about something, well, that's just their conversation. Uh, there's no way for anyone to find out about it. Even if you, even if people could tune into other people's conversations, there's enough conversations going on so that they wouldn't know which ones to tune into. And what Web2 has done is, it's a, it, it, is that it has given us ways of finding and participating in those conversations. There's three random conversations. You might, uh, you, you might realise that I tossed in plant varieties to uh, try and hold my audience here. Uh, but on other occasions, I've, you know, the, the other, other things have turned up there. So conversations break out, information is exchanged, and we can find our way to those conversations. We can't do it perfectly but we can do it pretty amazingly well. We can go on Google and search for the conversation. Uh, we can be on Twitter and, uh, and follow a hashtag, and that will often take us to the conversation, uh, and so on. Um, so, so what's happening, one way of thinking about this is that the web is generating, this is generating public goods, public goods of incredible value. Uh, I don't think many people will know what that is, but that is an encyclopedia, and it was the biggest encyclopedia until of about seven or eight years ago. It was bigger than Encyclopedia Britannica. It was put together in the 14th century, or maybe the 1400s, in China. It's called the Yongle Encyclopedia, and what you see there is a private, is a public good or a potential public good. That's the information in the encyclopedia and the private good, which is the paper that it's written on, and the two things are not 
It's not very easy to separate them. And that's a more modern version of pretty much the same thing. And I think those guys knew that the game was pretty much up when they reluctantly put out that DVD. Because they're starting to <laughs> they're starting to be an awful lot less private good and an awful lot less potential public good. At the same around about the same time, Jimmy Wales was working on a project called Newpedia, which was to create a public uh, expert sourced, I won't say crowdsourced, encyclopedia. And it wasn't much of a success. They got, I don't know, about 2,000 articles written and they sent them to experts and experts agreed to referee them and so on. And then one day they did a little experiment which was to just let anyone write this thing and they didn't really expect that to be a very successful experiment but it turned out that it kind of metastasized and we have with us this incredible thing called Wikipedia. Now what's significant there I think is that there's something powering all that powering people's desire to write this and it's something to do it, there are social motivations behind what they're doing uh, they know that it's going up there they know that they're participating in something bigger than they are and it's enough to get them there there's a whole lot of other things like the it's easy to vandalize but it's also easy to fix so there's actually no big incentive to vandalize and so on but it's it, it was an incredible thing uh, at the time and, and, and generally speaking, it's worth trying to figure out what this is, as a, how this has become a, a very standard technique that is used by people on the internet. And the trick goes like this. They're building, there is a sort of a dialectic between private goods and public goods. Um, and so we have to, to create the private goods, we have to meet some private needs. And I'll give you the example of Google. Google is, a, is, is probably, possibly the first web to um, uh, site, in the, certainly in some people's books, although I'd say the Linux operating system is also a web to phenomenon, even though it happened right at the outset of the internet, or the outset of the World Wide Web. Um, so Google does something, it provides you with a private good. The private good is that it helps you out. It helps you find what you're looking for. Uh, but there's more to it than that because they, how do they find out, how do they get, get you this private good? They firstly harvest the internet for the links in the, in the net which show you which, which and, and through their algorithm they can predict pretty well which link you're going to be most interested in. But then they listen in to what you're doing and what do you think happens if um, they're, if they're serving up you know, ten if, of the first ten links, following a particular search string like plant varieties, more people click on the third link than the first link. Pretty soon, the, that turns up up the top. So they're convert, they're, they're taking this little private good that the, that they're giving you the private good, and they're getting from you something which is of private benefit to them, but it's only of private benefit to them when they can convert it into a public benefit for everyone else. So that's a sort of a, a process, and, and this is a sort of a generalised uh, uh, way that an awful lot of things happen on the internet. And if you're thinking about mobile apps and so on, you may not need to think like this because they may be, it may be a mobile app where you've got governments <coughs> supply data and a mobile app, and all the mobile app is, is doing is making the data <laughs> more easily accessible in the field. But most of the time, it's actually possible to go both ways. And it's actually possible, it's important to be trying to think about how, with each move, you can enrich this feedback cycle, build better private goods for people by, at the same time as building better public goods. Uh, so anyway, so that, that, pattern, that pattern you will find repeats itself all over the place. I was, giving, I was giving a presentation on this in Singapore and the person who, a person speaking before me spoke about the importance of the Facebook like button. And I'm, I'm not much of a big, I, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. I like Twitter, but I'm not much of a fan of Facebook and I hadn't really thought about the like button. But the like button is actually a social version 
of all those things that Google do. It generates different information and therefore complementary information, really useful information about what kind of turns people on, what people like, um, and it's using our social instincts. We just feel that it's kind of fun, it's pretty easy, you press like, and that tells everybody else in the world, if they, if they happen to be part of your, if they happen to have dialed into your world, that, um, that gives that piece of information to them. In fact, it gives lots of different pieces of information away because we can add up how many likes are being, how many times this thing is being mm -hmm. liked around the globe, or someone might be on your Facebook page and they see that you like it. So it's immediately st uh, stratifying the information and making it useful. This is my favourite Web2 site. It's called Patients Like Me. It was designed by uh, a guy whose brother died of Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and it is a site on which people uh, with really horrible um, illnesses like Lou Gehrig's disease and more recently with mental, various mental health disorders keep a diary. The diary, uh, it's, uh, the, the diary is mostly data, it's about data um, and that data can then, then, they, then patients like me do the sort of stuff that Google does with data which is to turn this private good that people are getting a benefit from uh, into a public good by getting all that data together and figuring out what it means in aggregate and feeding it back to people and making it useful to people. Um, so I will, uh, there's another one. Uh, and that's a family tree site. People like going onto the family tree. It makes it nice and easy to Maybe they've not done it before, maybe they've done it lots of times before, but it makes it very easy for them to get all this stuff up in the cloud um, and get prompted for various things. And then way back in Silicon Valley or wherever their data, data center is, they're putting these pictures together and can connect up this jigsaw. And whole businesses are built on data exhaust. Nobody, I, I, I don't know whether Twitter's making any money yet, but it's still worth um, over a billion dollars in capital value. Somebody thinks it's worth money. Bitly, all Bitly does is provide you with ways of shortening a URL so you can get more letters into your Twitter message and they can build a business out of that because they sell the data to people to, so they can figure out what's trending and how their retailing is going and so on. And of course Google is the ultimate data exhaust business where they don't do hardly anything. If they're going to redesign a website, they'll do it in a kind of a Darwinian fashion, which is to try a little bit more red over there, serve it up, uh, serve the website up that way and the normal way, and then measure the difference. And they're just constantly optimising like that. And it's looking at things like that that leads you to sort of somehow get a glimmering of this idea that a system where everyone has to ask for permission every time they use something basically won't work. Or it certainly won't get the kinds of extraordinary serendipitous benefits that you can get out of this system because all sorts of people are using all sorts of information in all sorts of ways that you couldn't possibly have imagined. Uh, so. There's a bit of a message for you, uh, and, I, and that's particularly for those in government. For those in private industry, they have to come up with some judicious mix. They, have, they probably need to close some things. Google doesn't show us everything it does. It's amazing how much stuff it releases, um, and, and it's trying to make money. Uh, governments are trying, the role of governments is to build public goods, generally speaking, governments should err on the side of openness because they don't have to make money. And the odd thing is that governments have actually found it in many ways harder to do this than the best of the private, of, of the private companies. Um, in New South Wales, about three or four years ago, the, um, somebody scraped 
the bus timetables off the, uh, the, the uh, Public Transport Authority's website and put the information on an app, on an, on an iPhone app, which people could download for nothing. And what do you think the bureaucrats did about that? Well, they sued these people. What a terrible thing to be providing people with bus timetables for nothing. It's not a terrible thing to do. Um, and here's a set of slides presented by the, a slightly more enlightened uh, group of people at the Massachusetts Bay Area Transport Authority. Uh, he, the, 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 uh, this particular set of slides, or this particular part of the slides, begins with uh, the speaker saying, why is it so hard to find out when the next bus is going to arrive and so easy to find um, and, and so easy to find uh, weather data? And the answer is because the weather data has been built around a d dissemination model right from the start, so you can get your, your weather off Channel 7, Channel 9, any way you like. So they said, well, should we do the same thing here? So all they did was they released the data. And then within a couple of months, there were six applications built with that data. So they didn't have to pay anything for this. And people got the data the way they wanted to get the data. Um, the New South Wales Road Traffic Authority, having sued this uh, company, making the app and stopped them operating, then spent at least tens of thousands of dollars getting uh, a something with their brand on it, written by developers, and then it became the relevant app. Completely the wrong way to do it. They had to spend money, and for what? Uh, then in November, they started releasing uh, real-time data. And real t so it wasn't the bus timetable, it was your bus is two minutes late. And within one hour, some of that data started turning up on Google, on Google Maps. Uh, and it was, pretty, it was pretty mature within a few weeks. Uh, uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, even but within four weeks, this was starting to turn up in what, what the Americans call drugstores and we call milk bars because the proprietors of the milk bars knew that this would be of interest to their customers and that might attract more customers or maybe it was just doing the right thing by those customers and so this information was flowing freely around the community. Um, now, uh, and, and in fact, there is even a watch you can buy in San Francisco uh, which, uh, as you can see, you can tune in to an API and it will tell you how your, whether your bus is on time or whatever. So that's one model and that's the easiest model of all, which is you've got this data, it really isn't that hard, just relax, uh, let the data go, put it, uh, license at Creative Commons and you will watch it fly through the community with the greatest of ease. Uh, another one is, the, is, is a model that I call build, build, the, or build and they will come. Uh, and this is where you're, look, you're trying to find the right person. Wikipedia does this because it needs an article on the East African naked mole rat and uh, it turns out that somebody who knows something about that will turn up on, that site, on, that, on the relevant page. Uh, it just builds the architecture and the thing sorts itself out. The, and, and so I, I liken this to an exercise in Where's Wally and I'll, you'll find out a little more why I say that in a minute. Here's an, here's an example from the Australian National Library. They are digitising their back issues of newspapers all the way back to 1802. And the way that works is they, they do optical character recognition by computers. They then set up the website thus and when you go to the website you can click on you, you'll see the, 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 the page that you're looking at will divide itself into different stories when you click on this it it highlights itself it becomes um, uh, you know more um, more vivid and then you can see over here 
that they've made, that the computer has made some mistakes in digitising the image because it says woe stop work rather than no stop work and you can see that woe stop work has a kind of a human logic to it but it's not actually correct. So, uh, so uh, you click on the relevant tab, this then turns into a wiki and you <laughs> simply correct it, save and you've, and, and, and in the process by, tap, by tapping into people's interest in this stuff and their capacity and their OCD, basically, their, their um, most of us have an obsessive compulsive desire to correct mistakes and certainly plenty of people do there and it's been an incredible success. So it was never launched, it, it, uh, it simply opened for business in 2007. Uh, since then it has been, it's, there are people on the site correcting text as I speak uh, and 20% of the correctors are overseas. I don't know what proportion of them are Australian. Uh, there would, that would now be about 40 million lines of text being corrected. This is all for nothing. Uh, Julie Hempenstahl from Bendigo uh, has corrected more than 500,000 lines of code, uh, sorry, of text. That's Julie. She says that she prefers that to um, housework. Uh, and I thought Julie would never be beaten because whenever people sort of challenged Julie, she would just do a lot more correcting. But I was wrong. And here is the corrector from hell. Uh, and she took her over, Anne Manley from Arowina. And she's now, I went onto the site last night. It's not 680,000, it's getting up to uh, 900 and something thousand. She's nearly at a million this woman, and uh, pity, uh, pity poor Julie. Uh, and here they are at the National Library getting a reward for all their, all, uh, for all their efforts. Uh, and, and on the front page, and this is about motivation, of course, on the front page you have the, you have the leaderboard, uh, and leaderboards are pretty important. So this is the dark side of the internet, ladies and gentlemen, exploitation in Bendigo. You can do it too if you want. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about another company which is a company I'm associated with called Kaggle. And again, I'm just trying to give you a snapshot of the incredible, the incredible things that can happen when the world, when the, given that the world has opened up in the way it is. Kaggle crowdsources data analytics and may therefore be of some, in, some interest to some of you people if you're trying to analyse data, build predictive models out of data and so on. Here's an example of a problem which was will particular patients with HIV be sicker next week than this week? Uh, we know their genetic characteristics and we need a predictive model. The best model in the uh, literature was it, it, it was 70 percent before we decided to crowdsource that problem. So Kaggle exists to uh, take data, put it up on our website, say to people what we want to do with the data. We want you to build a model that will predict the progression of HIV in patients given their genetic markers and then we turn it into a competition. Uh, and it's incredible what has happened. So uh, the state of the art was 70%. Within a week and a half, the, the leader uh, was at 70.8%. The competition closed at 77% accuracy. And that was for a $500 US prize. Uh, and the guy who did it is a guy called Chris Ramondi, who we'll meet a little later on. But on the strength of that, somebody came along with a little bit more money because the Heritage Health Provider Network in California has hundreds of thousands of patients and they want a model to predict who's going to hospital in the next six months because then they can be targeted for more preventative care which will massively lower their costs. So it makes sense for them to offer a $3 million prize open to all of you. Uh, and uh, the first milestone prize of 50,000 went off about three weeks ago. We put milestone prizes out there so people can then put their own work, so their own work 
is then delivered to the community and then everybody can look at who's doing well and build on that. And that was built, uh, and uh, that was won by a couple of people who teamed up, and one of them was in Melbourne, so that was rather nice. Um, you might need to get in touch with him. Um, so this is so NASA asked us to help model dark matter. Modeling dark matter is a tricky business; it's not easy to see. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the way. It is what data scientists call a signal-to-noise problem. What better than to get a glaciologist to solve that problem? And within a week and a half, uh, no, sorry, within less than a week, this guy had beaten all the astronomers at NASA over the previous 10 years because he had signal to noise problems in glaciology and had solved them in ways that the astronomers hadn't thought of. Um, and as he says in that tweet, not bragging or nothing, but the White House just compared me to Newton and Einstein. <laughs> which they roughly did. They didn't really. They mentioned, them, they mentioned him on the same page as Newton and Einstein, but it was still a nice thing to have happen to Martin and to Kaggle. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think we'll, go on, we'll go on with that story a little bit later. This is a government exercise. This was both the Victorian and the New South Wales government were interested in getting help via a global competition to make predictions of traffic flow on their, uh, on their freeways. Um, and uh, both had elections coming up. And one of them, that, for one of them, that meant that they didn't go ahead. Uh, and for the other, it meant that they did go ahead. Uh, but the predicted possible bad story, hey, not all our freeways flow perfectly freely all the time, actually came true. And in New South Wales, they went ahead with this thing and there was a little story in the Parramatta Times or whatever it was, that um, the government was wasting money on competitions to uh, estimate our traffic problems rather than to solve them. Well, it, uh, this actually does help solve them, but let's not get, let's not get too technical. Uh, so. So there is just an amazing number of ways in which crowdsourcing can be applied. Um, I quickly want to uh, uh, so I quickly want to introduce you to a couple of uh, a few people. That's Chris Raimondi. He won the HIV competition. Does he know anything about bioinformatics? No. Does he have any qualifications in statistics at all? No. Um, he taught himself. Uh, how to do this on YouTube videos. Why was he doing that? Because he's doing Google search engine optimization in a one-man band in Baltimore and he got interested in data. And do you know who came second in the competition? The TJ Watson Research Centre at IBM. This guy wanted to get a job in Microsoft Research, and not an easy thing to do, but he now has a job in Microsoft Research because he went into the chess ratings competition and beat Microsoft Research at um, designing a chess rating algorithm. So that was a nice way in. And then there was Jeremy Howard. And Jeremy Howard is the only person pictured there in all of those early comps who got a place in every comp he went into. All the others were kind of one-off one offers. So we were quite interested in Jeremy. Jeremy uh, doesn't have any qualifications either. Uh, he's a He's a, done an honours degree in philosophy, but he didn't much like that. He, we wondered where he lived. Well, we actually knew fairly early on that he lived in Melbourne. And he lives in my same development as me. And he's now Kaggle's chief data scientist. So uh, again, an, a sort of an example of the, all the serendipity coming out of the uh, woodwork in all of these kinds of things. These are, these are the institutions that you get access to when you run these sort of competitions because those are the people who, uh, because these are, the, these are the people who enter those competitions. So, um, I've, so, so finally then, let me show you Justin McMurray. And I quite like to use this, um, I quite like to use this picture just to get people thinking about the possibilities. Um, Justin McMurray is on the help desk of Verizon. That doesn't look like the help desk of Verizon, but it is. J 
Justin McMurray is not being paid to do this. He is retired, but he says he prefers helping people out on the Verizon help desk to playing games of golf, and he does that 25 hours a week. And it just kind of goes to show, it just kind of goes to show, that doesn't seem to me to be one of the more rewarding things to do with your time, but that's just me. Uh, but the things that governments and, and lots of other people have to do might be a lot more compelling than that. And the message I get out of that is that one can configure government or any organisation pretty much any way you want. I'm not saying that you can do this frivolously. I'm not, what I am, what I'm saying there is that what constrains you now is psychology and working with people and all of the things that people like, but walls and places, you are simply not constrained by those things anymore. Um, I began with the theme of why it's so easy. I've sort of tried to show you some of the things that, that are easy about this. I've hinted at some of the things that are hard about this. What's hard about this is that the possibilities are so, they're like sort of filaments. We don't know quite where they are. They arrive serendipitously. Um, and they usually arrive out of a kind of an openness and a playfulness, if you like, an ability of people to just try new things that governments are awful at and large organisations are usually pretty bad at. And if you look at some of the more successful organisations, I'm thinking particularly of Google, they try to build the entire organisation around the idea, as one of them, as, 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 as their chief economist said to me, because um, he's becoming a shareholder in Kaggle, I'm pleased to say, um, how is it when, cr when crowds can be so wise, how, com how come committees can be so dumb? Um, Google is built around that. It's got 20, you get, have 20% time, so people inside Google are expected to work one day a week on a project of their design or a friend's design for Google. It's not, they can't sort of do anything they like. They can't go, well, they can, but they, they'll soon find they're out of the company if they go surfing. Um, so, so they're trying to disrupt the normal techniques that we have in organisations for basically telling people what to do, which of course tells them a whole lot of things they can't do. Uh, if if you look at the, this was a, a bunch of um, this was a bunch of associations I put together at a I've played with it a bit, but it, this was for a, a a symposium of government data people, and they were talking about data linkage for educational purposes, linking federal data, state data, and state data with other state data. And what I was drawing their attention to is this over here is this world of Web 2 data. People like Google, people like Twitter, Facebook, and so on, a completely different world to this public world of data where we have surveys to get the data and we have compulsion sometimes, for instance, in the census, uh, and the whole thing is kind of built designed from the top down, has, is slow moving, has real trouble quickly adapting to something, quickly noticing something as a possibility or trying it out and so on. So th that's why it's so hard. We have organisations built for this world and what has opened up is this incredible set of possibilities in that world. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.